Ladies and gentlemen, we're grateful that you're here tonight for our Planning Commission meeting for Wednesday, August 5th, 2015. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the Pledge of Allegiance, and if I could have Commissioner Wilson come back for us. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The first item on our agenda tonight is some approval of some past minutes going back to uh, April 23rd and uh, there are several of those. Uh, there's a couple of them where I was not present, so it was just the two of you, and I think for that reason we should probably go ahead and continue that approval, and uh, so I'll entertain a motion that we do that. I would move that we um, move, move this to the next planning commission for the approval of, of what, you know which minutes they are that you weren't here? Uh, C and E. So May 6th okay. and June 18th are the two that I was not present for. I got Tracy was, here now. So. The guy was gone on the 23rd. Okay. B. Okay. I'll second the motion. So we just your motion just to move just those two? Um, unless you had a concern about any of the others. We can approve the others. We might be able to approve those for Tracy. Yeah, now that Tracy's here. Has anybody had a chance to go through? I was at all of them. Look at you. <laughs> so I can go through these real quick. Uh, the first one was a work session and uh, held. We reviewed the, the CPAT and discussed uh, continue our discussions about the mixed use uh, general plan designation. Uh, so that's the one on April. 23rd, and yeah, Jens, you were gone for that one. Uh, May 6th, had a zone change for the town homes at Maggie's Band. It had a preliminary plat for that same town home and then Meadow Creek Ridge. So they don't know some Title 15 text changes. So we recommend approval there. And then there was a work session that was held afterwards. June 3rd, conditional use permit for Verizon cell tower modification, zone change for the Parkview townhomes where Commissioner Wilkinson still owes us donuts. Yeah, I have a question on that. It says that my phone rang during the commissioner's meeting here, and I owe donuts, so um, can you tell me who I owe the donuts to? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, it's anyone in attendance in the next meeting. Okay, <laughs> yes. all right, I can do that. We yeah, have, they'd like to have some fun. Can also. That's right. Uh, the preliminary plat for also for that part of few town homes. Uh, Eagle's Nest, and then we adjourned. Uh, the June 18th, both myself and Commissioner Nielsen were not present for that. Uh, we continued discussion. That, that was another work session, that's right. Uh, continuing our discussions on mixed use. So, Tracy and Brad, and then our last seven meeting minutes was the last meeting of July 8th. Uh, storage unit change, zone change up on the north end of town. And then uh, lots of discussion on that one. And then Eagle Crest and development up on the east side of town and a preliminary flat for Eagle Crest. So, any questions or concerns about those minutes? I guess I'll entertain a different motion. Right. <laughs> Do we need to uh, approve each one separately? I don't think so. We just so. can approve them in mass. Okay. I'll make an, a motion to approve all of the minutes on the dates listed. I second the motion. So we have a motion by Commissioner Tag and a second by Commissioner Wilkinson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Our next item is the uh, zone change on Canyon Creek. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we just talked about this briefly and then before the meeting started. I mentioned that we don't want to take this request too lightly, but frankly, where the applicant's requesting a, a zoning change to make the zoning more restrictive, and that the 
potentially allow for retail development. Those are things that, that generally we as a city look very favorably upon. So um, subject property is on Kirby Lane, between Kirby Lane and US 6. Um, I understand that uh, Woodbury Corporation is in the process of purchasing that. There was a trust plant located on the subject property for a number of years. It's outlined kind of in red here. You can see it pretty well because of the colors next to it. You can see properties to the east are already zoned commercial too. And the proposal is that to change from the industrial one zone, the I-1 zone. You can see the, the gray color here, all of those properties are currently zoned industrial one. And again, the change is to go from that zoning district to commercial two. The development review committee uh, reviewed this a couple of weeks ago and recommended that it be approved. We've got a public hearing scheduled with you tonight to consider this request with the city council in a couple of weeks. Any questions for staff? Uh, this is a public hearing. We need a motion to move into public hearing. I was going to think so. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that sometime. We do it sometimes. Yeah, so yeah. I just want to make sure we're doing it right here. Uh, so that's what you get for having a volunteer board, right? Okay. Figuring out your way. Uh, so it's a public hearing, so if, uh, we'll open up the public hearing and invite anybody present uh, that would like to make a comment about this zone change. Seeing none, we'll let the record state that we didn't have anybody that wanted to come up and make a comment. So we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Uh, any comments or discussion amongst the commission? Well, I think we talked about this earlier. It seems to fit uh, where we're going with this area. No objections from staff. Um, doesn't seem to be any reason to oppose it. I think just for those that are maybe watching or, or that are threatening the audience today, um, our discussions as a planning commission is we are to, we're, we're starting the process of reviewing our general plan. And so I think the direction that our discussions have been at this point will point towards uh, being okay with this. So I don't see that I have any issues with it either. So, so if uh, anyone wants to make a motion, we'll let you do that. I did just one comment, question yeah, though. Would you come forward, please? <clears throat> yeah. It was just a question I had until you said we were going in this, this area. What do you mean by that comment? So this is the area, uh, you're familiar with this location. Mm -hmm. So that entire area, of course, we have Walmart, we have other retail and commercial developments coming in. And so a lot of that area is turning commercial. So this, this is just an extension of that. That's kind of what I meant. That's what you meant, but what do you mean by the, the stuff that, I mean, you only have a little bit now left that's it's, uh, industrial. Right. What, do you, what did you comments to that? The, there's a, just a little bit left? Well, that building right there, that's still in the gray area. What, I mean, you, you've taken everything that used to be industrial and changed it all to C2. You say you're changing the general plan. I just want to know what your comment to that is. What are you, what are you looking at changing? I think that was more my comment. So, oh, yeah, maybe I'm not. Well, his, his first was that we're looking at this area. So I don't know when he says the area, what area he's talking about. If he's talking about well, Persona or it's, it's, it's Sapa, it's not Persona, it's Sapa. Whether you're talking about that whole area, or you're just talking about the one little area. What I mean, what are your plans? Are you planning on pushing more and more? Well, I think just generally an extension of this area that's commercial where the development's coming, it would make sense to, if there is opportunity for commercial development, to just, you know, extend that out. Now, it won't affect this, and, you know, we may decide that... So where have you moved your industrial area to? We haven't moved it anywhere. So you've taken, you've, taken, taken, you've taken all the industrial now and don't have any industrial area? For industrial, all you have is retail in Spanish work? Oh, no. Can we no. show the bigger map? Of the I'm just curious. This field's gray. This mm -hmm. is all all over there. Yeah. yeah. So your your desire would to have all of it over on the other side of the freeway? I, I think not that's, necessarily. That's right. Right. I'm just trying to figure out where you where you're going with your general plan and what you're doing with that little 
I'm just I'm speaking much more narrow than maybe what you interpreted or what I said. I this area right here is all we're talking about tonight. Tonight. Okay, but and when you say the general plan, are you discussing the general plan or are you going out the general plan? We don't know yet. We, we, we just what started that, but we just started that conversation. Um, so obviously this area is, is commercial. This area is future plan for the uh, hospital uh, that's discussed. That's a business park development or zoning, excuse me. And then this area up here would be the industrial zone that, that we're kind of talking about what is what is the right thing for that? Is, is the industrial zone the correct zoning for that or general plan designation? Well, see, that's what worries me. If you're going to take all that up there and change from industrial, what are you going to do this one little spot that's not, that's not your retail? You're talking about where Sabbath is? Yeah. <clears throat> what, what do you think? I, I don't have the answer to that, sorry. I don't think the idea is that we would change that with that industrial business operating there. That there's no intent to, to try to force something on somebody that's not ready to move. So what do you do with running 24-7 at night when it makes noise and stuff like that with all this other zoning now that you moved in here? You mix the industrial with the other stuff. And, and that's, and they, we, we don't feel like the, the, it's not an in, incompatible use to have a commercial facility. If it were residential there, that may be a different issue, but I don't. I don't think we're foreseeing any kind of residential necessarily in this area. So, that compatibilities of uses will be something that we'll definitely take into consideration as we look at what the future for that area looks like. So, can you change all that stuff on me? I mean, the different some different uh, qualifications of so, zoning so and different maybe things like that. Maybe there's two things we need to understand here. So, general plan provides a vision. That doesn't change the underlying zoning. Mm -hmm. Well, I know so, because the general plan used to have that as industrial originally. Right. right. That's that's what the general plan was. Right. And it's changed. Is your concern there's not enough industrial left for? Uh, I I am a little bit concerned. I mean, well, and also because I I work at SAP, I'm concerned about what you're going to do with my livelihood. I don't think we're doing that. Yeah, we're, I don't think we're going to touch yeah. that. Other than you bring all this down there, now we have to be, I mean, we have uh, aluminum down there that it's very, uh, you know, that uh, people come in and take a free will. You need know, more people, more people down there is going to cause a lot more, a lot, a lot more problems for us. Well, we, we appreciate the input and we'll consider that as we... But that's all I'm concerned is I wasn't worried until he said, you know, this the area, it sounded to me like, you know, and like you said, the top area up there that is industrial, you're really looking at changing that. That's part of our discussion. Whether it does happen. Or yeah, I know. I understand that. I don't know whether it will or not. I'm just voicing my opinion there. That you've moved all the in uh, industrial onto the other side of the freeway. It looks to me that's like what your general plan is. Oh, and it's been that way for, I don't know, Dave, how long has that been? How long has this been industrial? In general Since plans. it was annexed, I'm sure. Back well, no, that was, right, but that I'm was saying that all this other here was industrial, so that's all always industrial. Right? And it was industrial for a long time, also. So that's my concern. I just wanted to know if I need to be concerned about where you're going, if I need to start doing some things, or, or, or what, because every, every, every time it's just a little piece, a little more, a little more, a little more. I don't understand why this was never done before now. This little piece. Why? You know, why I, I think, from my perspective, it's one of those things where I, I kind of just thought that it was because it's always been kind of part of Woodbury's plan, and I think it's just something that got slipped through the cracks. And I, I always just assumed that it was already zoned. So sort of I was also I was a little yeah. surprised that it wasn't. That's why I was just kind of surprised why it wasn't before when they were doing the whole thing. And so what that means. Will they be doing piecemeal all along there? Is that see? That's that's what I'm saying. It's not. It's not a plan. If you just keep doing a little piece at a time, it's just like whenever we want to do it, we'll change it. It doesn't seem like there's any following those plan at all. But this Woodbury thing is just we'll take this piece now, and then six months down the road, we'll take this other piece and change it. And they plan it out better and get the whole thing done at once. Well, I'm just curious. The history of the. Of this area, there's been a lot of actually a lot of discussion, a lot of planning. Um, but you know, until until uh, someone's ready to pull the trigger, you know, none of these types of decisions to change 
zoning, for example. So you don't. So they don't. I guess you. Know, if, if they don't own the property, like you say, he's going to buy that property. If he's not owning it, there's he can't change the zoning because he has no no interest. Well, there's probably isn't in a reason to to make the request until and, and the city wouldn't. I mean, I I, I guess what. Our perspective is, is the city, ha like Bruce said, city has its goals, and we look at what's, you know, what coming, what the future is. And in this area, the future is just more commercial than it is industrial right now. So I mean, I, I understand that, but that's so. So that's the other question I have, though. Can you change any zoning at any time without somebody requesting it? Can you just change it? Yeah, I suppose we could. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah so in fact, we talked up. about this area for strategic purposes. We talked about changing the zoning here so that if a business decided to come to Spanish Fork and wanted to know if we had a place ready with the proper zoning already, mm -hmm. that they could buy it they would have place for it. could be ready. We did. So we did talk about it. So yeah, you can. So you take the place where Iron Homes is up there, right? Is that what it's called? Or the Iron Place Home? Iron Homes. Home. Yeah. So that's, that's industrial now. So if you wanted to, could you just change that zoning on it? And, and what would happen is that they would be a, a you know, I don't know if the word grandfather is the right word. Illegal law conforming. Yeah, illegal law conforming um, is what they call it. And so they, that use would be able to continue to stay. Okay. That's what I'm curious about. Until, even, even though you until, change the zoning, it still right. stay there until they go back. Yes, yeah, until the property changes, changes hands. I think that's what. Yep. Even with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's also you know, a public hearing like we're having tonight where there's input and, you know, the, anyway, it wouldn't just be under the table uh, without anyone knowing, without anyone noticing. No, I understand that. I understand that. That's why. I was just curious how the other was going there and where and, and what the future direction was there. So, do you mind stating your name for the Londo. Londo. Yes, sir. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> We have a motion. The zoning from an I is it one to a C two is what the recommendation is um, for the old trust plant. I don't know what the official name of that area is, but I would make that recommendation to the city council to do that. Well second. Okay, so we've got a it's motion. The, it's the Canyon Creek zone change. Is it okay? Canyon Creek zone change. We got a recommendation from Commissioner Wilkinson and a second by Commissioner Nielsen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. All right. The, the next item is uh, conditional use permit for 300 North Accessory Apartment. Mr. Anderson. Once again, thank you. Um, let me start by just talking a little bit about accessory apartments. We'll talk about what they are and what rules come into play in Spanish Fork when somebody maybe wants to have a legal accessory apartment. So first of all, by definition, an accessory apartment is a dwelling unit that exists within an existing single family home. Typically they're in a basement and the owner of the property has to live in the home. We wouldn't necessarily care if they were in the basement part or the upstairs, but the owner has to reside on premise to have a legal accessory apartment. So again, it's a dwelling unit within a bigger dwelling unit. We call it a single family home. So if, for example, uh, an accessory apartment gets approved by the planning commission as a conditional use, and we call that a single family home with an accessory apartment. We have a lot of accessory apartments in the city. Um, the vast majority of the legal accessory apartments that we have are in kind of this part of the city, the area that we'll talk about here in a minute or the area that surrounds the city office building, the part of the city that has the gridded square blocks, the old part of town. 
And a lot of those accessory apartments have been there for a really long time. And I'll touch on that when we talk about some of the specifics of this request in just a minute. Now, in order to have a new accessory apartment approved, a property has to meet a couple of uh, conditions or criteria. First of all, the property has to be zoned either R16 or R3. And again, most of the parts of the city that are zoned R16 and R3 are found on the blocks that surround us, kind of the old historic part of town. Um, in this case, the property is zoned R16. Also, the property has to be at least 10,000 square feet in size. So not quite, but almost a quarter of an acre for a home to have a legal accessory apartment. In this case, the property is about twice that size, almost 20,000 square feet, or maybe close to about a half of an acre. Um, and those really are the two main criteria. When we get people that call us about potentially having an accessory apartment approved, most of the time when we say no, it's because the property is not zoned properly or because the property is not large enough. And in this case, again, the property is zoned properly and the property is big enough for the city to approve a conditional use for an accessory apartment. So, um, obviously, tonight this is on your agenda as a conditional use. Um, accessory apartments are just that. And we'll talk for a second about what a conditional use is. A conditional use, you guys are well aware, but uh, it also benefit. There are uses that are allowed in a particular zone. Even in the case of accessory apartments, there are some criteria that have to be met. But provided those criteria are met, we're obligated as the zoning jurisdiction to approve um, conditional uses. But as part of the approval, if you as the land use authority want to impose conditions with the intent that those conditions would mitigate any anticipated adverse impacts of the conditional use, legally you can do that as the land use authority. So that's where the, the word conditional ties into what we're talking about tonight, the imposition of site-specific conditions. Any questions or anything you guys want to talk about just relative to what accessory apartments are or criteria? <clears throat> this was already uh, discussed with the development committee. Yes. And besides the Title 15 compliance, there were a couple other things that uh, the city was requiring of them. Can you review that? You bet. Yeah. So in this specific case, um, let's just talk for a second about what the exact proposal is. So the property is located at 260 West, 300 North, right here. There's an existing single family dwelling here. We might have a better image, like a page or two down. Bigger. Yeah, just scroll down, I think. Not a lot better, but a little bigger. Um, so this is the subject property. An existing single family home there, which is several decades old. Um, several other buildings on the property, different accessory buildings, including a garage structure here, which I remember the amendment that we made to Title 15 a little while ago. Um, I'm almost certain that based on the criteria that we created for garages that this qualifies as having enough room to be a two-car garage, which is another one of the criteria that we have in order to have an accessory parking. You have to have a total of four parking spaces off street. Two of them have to be in a garage. It's really the idea, although we don't regulate this, that each unit, the single family part and the accessory part, we're going to have access to a garage space and at least one other space, which incidentally, with this property, there is a lot of room available for parking. So that hasn't been an issue, but sometimes it is. Sometimes that's one of the, the things that disqualifies somebody from having an accessory apartment. So they, this, that, that very thing alone would disqualify probably a huge percentage of people that may want to do this, is that right? Just, just, just don't use the other that much space. Um, and oftentimes we sit down with people and talk about building a maybe a new detached garage on their property to be able to meet that criteria. They simply don't want to incur that expense or otherwise impact their property to do that. So you're right. Um, particularly, again, we're talking about a part of the city where if there, if there was a garage built with the house back in the 
20s or 30s maybe when the home was built. It's usually pretty small. I've seen a car kind of in the arrangement. So, yeah, that's... And then it's the idea that the, the parking would be a tandem parking arrangement where two cars in the garage and two cars in the driveway, in essence? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. As long as there's space that's 9 by 18 for each soft park, parking spot. It doesn't matter where they are located on the site. Is that That's correct? my recollection. Yeah. So, and to, uh, to try to get to Commissioner Wilkinson's question, um, currently, it's been this way as I understand it for a number of decades, there's a kitchen in the basement of the structure that we're talking about. Um, it's been used in the past as an accessory apartment, uh, owners residing upstairs. Um, it may have been used as a duplex as well, where the owners weren't living on the premise. But again, what we're talking about tonight would require that the owners reside on the property. We'll just talk about that for a second. That's an important stipulation, I believe, and we've talked about. Um, just given that in most cities' experience with accessory apartments and having the owners reside on premise, you end up not dealing with some of the issues that more typically come when you have absentee landlords. People that simply have rental properties oftentimes who don't live in the community even, just simply more of a propensity to have less oversight, less concern about who's maybe renting in a basement and different things like that. So um, for me, that's a really important component of our program here with accessory apartments where the owner has to reside on premise. Um, that's no guarantee that you're going to get uh, great property maintenance and you know healthy screening of maybe tenants and that type of a thing. But uh, again, the propensity at least is that that helps avoid some problems that you get when the owner's not on the property. Um, so the home, as we understand, basically is set up to uh, have an accessory apartment in the basement now. But as part of this approval, they will have to meet some current code requirements by way of upgrading the electrical, um, perhaps make some other changes like the HVAC and that type of a thing. And uh, as the Development Review Committee reviewed the proposal, that indeed is the recommendation that they made that the conditional use be approved, subject to the applicant meeting any current building code requirements to come into play. Um, and one of the, the big ones there, so we spelled it out separately, is just meeting any conditions that uh, our electrical department has for accessory apartments. Uh, for example, we'll need to have a second meter added. Um, we have uh, a lengthy history of challenges that come when two separate dwelling units share one power meter. So we work hard to avoid creating new arrangements where that's the case. Um, but uh, all in all, Again, uh, as far as having a conditional use approved for an accessory apartment at this location, it's been pretty easy for us as staff to see that it meets the criteria that we have spelled out in Title 15. Um, there are eight or nine different uh, stipulations that have to be met that are noted in your staff report. Um, and we recommend that the conditional use be approved subject to those three conditions that, that we've identified. Can you talk about the footprint of the buildings that exist on the property and if any changes will be made to those. Yeah, thank you. Um, relative to this request, um, there will not be any changes to the footprint of the single family home. No, no expansion. Uh, that's not to say that in the future they couldn't apply to go through this process again to be able to expand the conditional use, maybe add square footage and that type of a thing. Um, given the nature of the structure, I'd be really surprised if that ever happened. They could do that, but but no. it wouldn't be that they could go and add something behind the structure. They would have to add on to the existing structure. Is that right? We don't allow accessory apartments in accessory buildings. They have to be in part the of the primary dwelling, um, primary structure, the dwelling on the property. So if there was any addition made in the future, it would be to the existing home. It would be, yeah. That's not to say that they couldn't apply for a permit, maybe to add a garage or something like that. If they met our criteria for that type of thing, we'd issue that permit. But, um, 
what we're talking about tonight would be contained in the existing single family home. I don't think you would see any change in fact from the exterior to that structure. Any other questions for staff? Okay. This is a public hearing, so we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing and invite any members of the public to come forward and, and uh, ask any questions or make any statements. When you do come up, if you'll state your name for the record. And <clears throat> My name is Cheryl Hill. I live on 300 North, 300 West, just down the street from this uh, request. I'd like to approach this from a little different perspective. I know that I can't talk about the legal ramifications of what this is all involved in, but let me talk to you a little bit about that street. I'm 82 years old, and that street has been there since I was just a kid. Now, that street has some historical significance. I don't know whether you're aware of it, but there, as you come off Main Street, there's a big house right there uh, behind the stores. That big house is a historic house. It was built by a pioneer. And the brick that is in that house was made by a pioneer. If you go to the other end on 300 uh, West, there are two pioneer homes there. The one big home, I know when it was made. It was made in the 1800s. Now, if you go down that street, it's very interesting to see what that street represents. There are homes there that are over 100 years old, I know. And there are homes that are 70 years old. Now, my question here is this. When is Spanish Fork going to pay, take a real strong stand on these historical streets and make sure that zoning laws do not interfere with the historic nature of those streets? I think it's critical for our younger generation to see those homes. Those homes have been constantly lived in as single family homes for so many years. And now we're asking to come in and make apartment house on one of them. And this is going to open up a whole can of worms. What I think the city ought to do is they ought to take a survey of this whole town and find those blocks that have this historical footprint and make sure that zoning laws are not passed that change the nature of those. Now, apartments will change the nature. I can tell you that. I don't care if it's one of these accessory apartments. It changes the nature and opens up a whole kind of worms. That street needs to be protected. That whole street needs to be protected. Those homes are not magnificent. Of course not. But what they represent <coughs> is how this city was built from the very beginning. It was the working class people who built Spanish Fork. Those homes, those old homes along there, are working class homes, single family. And they've made a great contribution to this city. Now, there aren't a lot of streets like this one. I know that. Some of them have been botched up. Some of them have, have uh, torn down the great buildings. As a kid, I was just sick when they tore that beautiful red sandstone uh, house on Main Street down and built that old Safeway store. What a travesty that was. That was a beautiful red sandstone home. We have just destroyed our connection to the past. If we open this up, it will cause a real problem. I plead with you. Number one, <coughs> as a city, find these blocks that need to be preserved. And number two, use this one as an example and don't change the zoning. Thank you, Mr. Hill.
My problem is with these accessory apartments. Who's gonna police it? Who's, who's gonna tell them, I mean, where my uh, parents live? I lived in Wafala, and this house had 30 people living in it. The city never did anything with it. Nothing. Is there rules? Who can, how many people can live in this place? Sure. I mean, just like he said, this is this is a wonderful neighborhood. I live on one of the busiest roads in Spanish Fork. If I go in my backyard, I don't want to listen to an apartment. Try and get away from that road, just to sit in my backyard. I don't think, I mean, I kind of understand where these people are coming from, but Who's going to police it? The city cool. never did anything in Wafala. Let me just ask you a question. Would it, would it be different for you if the family that lives there, let's say a new family bought the house and they had a large family, so they had several children downstairs, several upstairs, and overall, you know, quite a few more people in the house than if they had the current situation and a renter. Does that change your view of, in other words, the impact? If it's a family, fine, but you're talking about a whole different family living in the basement. I, I don't know. I just want to know. Is it, I'm just, is it the impact, the number of people, or what's your... With the people within it? I just wanted to know who would be able to police it. I mean, who would... I don't know. But what they did in Wolf Hollow was a joke. Okay. Thank you. being there just to follow up on what this question was does the city have some kind of I mean if the people move in there there's people who I understand have to live uh, as the residents and owners of the property in one section are they limited to what they can rent the lower section to or one of the other sections I mean does it have to be a family can it be students can it be whatever they decide or is there a stipulation that way for the staff on that. That's, rather sure. That's a great question. Um, we require that uh, both units be used as units for as single family units, is the best way to say it. So that would be upstairs and downstairs. downstairs. Uh -huh. okay. um, one kitchen, one laundry room, everybody having access to all parts of the unit. Now, if we wanted to have two roommates down there living in that kind of an arrangement, Two separate bedrooms. We want to have four different roommates living in one of those dwelling units. Maybe more than that. That would be legal. All that we regulate is whether it's one dwelling unit um, or something other than that. So where things start to become red flags for us. Uh, typically, we don't have this issue in this part of town. It is more often the case in the newer part of town. Mm -hmm where you've got maybe a 4,000 square foot dwelling, and people start to partition off different parts of the dwelling. There may be a separate kitchen was constructed for canning or some other purpose at one point in time, so that was allowed, but then people close off a door and out a wall, and all of a sudden you've got a couple of different laundry rooms and um, two distinct dwelling units. When that's the case, that's, that's, that's a red flag, that's a Mr. Sant city prosecutor gets involved and we, we take enforcement action. But um, relative to this situation, I hope this makes sense. That makes sense as long as they're, they're just individual dwelling units. Sometimes we use the phrase housekeeping units as well. One kitchen, you know, shared access to all parts of the dwelling. You could have, the owners could rent uh, um, maybe like college students 
uh, or somebody else that wouldn't be related. They, they could they could rent to but roommates a uh, roommates because yeah, less students. So not necessarily a family That's per se. Correct. As long as the, the structure is one housekeeping unit, it's maybe a better phrase to use in this case. Um, that would be legal. Okay. Now that said, um, and I don't think staff's recommending this in this case. But the last time we looked at a conditional use, I think the Planning Commission did impose some conditions about how many people could reside in the accessory apartment. I believe that had more to do with the size of the property. Um, that was in a new development, pretty narrow lot. Um, there was some concern about having any more vehicles than just four. Um, but uh, you can impose conditions as part of this process if you feel it's appropriate to limiting it. I don't think that's something staff's recommending, but that's something you can consider. Okay, thank you for that. Because that just becomes a concern if there are a number of students who are being able to move in there. And then, because we talked about the, the number of cars that could be on the premise or that they're required to have, if you start, you know, being able to put that, then all of a sudden you've got a, a lot more traffic going in there with parking. It's really not designated for parking. My other concern, too, is with that, Apparently, they're not going to be building any structures for the vehicles, or will there be? Is there any proposal? I guess that's my other, because when we come in here, there's not really been any shown proposals as to what you're attempting or wanting to do to accommodate those parking vehicles or whatever else. So they know they've got one garage, right here, and, and it's maybe a, a car and a half garage, um, and then some sheds in the back portion. Are they going to be removed and other buildings taking place there? Or can they do that? What's been represented to us is that there aren't going to be any exterior changes to any of the structures on the premise, with maybe one exception. They might change the door on the front of this building if they chose, make it a lot easier to get to the garage. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. But with um, our requirement that a garage space be nine feet wide and 18 feet deep, this structure qualifies without changing in the exterior look of it at least. So they wouldn't have to. And I think that's their plan. To do something like Right. That. So we've, right. we've considered um, that building as proposed to meet the, the garage requirement. And obviously there's plenty of other surface area for parking outside. So, so there won't be another detached garage per se being Considered there with yeah. what we're talking about, or could they do that? No, but certainly if they if they applied for a building permit tomorrow to build an accessory building, a garage, any place on the property, if they met our setback requirements, just like any any property in the city, we'd issue the permit for that. But I, they haven't discussed that with us at all, and that's not been proposed at all up to this point. So okay. so basically, what's happening is accessory apartment to existing buildings that are there, or what's going to be used. Okay. And then just one other question I have, I guess, is we, with the property we've got there, uh, we, we on occasion park farm equipment back there. Uh, I don't live there anymore, but, I, but we do have, from my mother's house, we can go back and park farm equipment. I keep some equipment back there. Currently, there's a fence that's a cedar post fence with kind of a solid wood, supposedly maybe about yay high. Is there anything that's required from the development? Is that right here? Right here? Yes. Right here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. That, um, that fencing would need to be changed in between the properties with people granting or anything out? Uh, is, is there anything that, that, that has to be of that, just for my own information? Based on the regulations, I don't believe so. There isn't anything regulation-wise that they would need to worry about the fencing between. So if there was something that was to be there, it would need to be between us yes. and those people. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's what I was just, okay. Question for you, Frank. Is, for you, is it the impact of more vehicles or more people that concerns you the most? Both. I, I, I just, when, when, when you're saying that college students could come in there, then each college student could come if there's four or five, six, whatever they may decide. It doesn't sound like there's a limitation to what they could have. So if a limitation were put on there, like Dave said, a condition of X number of people living or X number of vehicles, that would, that would be a little easier for you to support. There were fewer. Yeah. Well, well I, I don't know that to support, but I, I'm just I'm just asking some questions to try to find out because I'm just saying that if it's just a family that has you know one or two children, 
then that creates a whole different situation than if there's opened up to, to, to six or seven students sure. who can come in and then you've got some parking that can take place with here, but then there's enough area back there that they can have all sorts of vehicles parked across there. Um, but I guess my other concern is, like I said, I do have some equipment there which becomes interesting for <laughs> young children or teenagers or whoever to hop across the fence and go and explore that. We have some things in my mother's backyard that are there for our family and the relations to play in. And we've noticed that because they are there, there's not other you know, things for children to play with. We've had a daycare group, a lady who was doing daycare, that would have their children come down, and that's where the daycare was. It was in our backyard. Bring blankets, lunch, and everything. And that's where they could come in the morning. And then when the mothers would come to pick them up a few minutes before, they would take them back. We didn't know what was happening. And we found out that we were becoming the daycare, and they were being paid for daycare that they never provided, per se. So I, I guess it's just a concern that we do have some things that could be an attraction. And so that's my question with the fence, if there was anything that needed to be done there, because I, would, I wouldn't like very much if there were you know, a lot of people there, a lot of young children there that could you know, get over a fence, come in where we've got some equipment or whatever else, and so then proceed on into the yard. In that regard, it would probably be no different than if a new family moved in and you said, oh, I think with these little children in this new family, we're going to you know, change the fence. Your, your liability or your risk wouldn't be any different now than it would be no, with no, a no, not not necessarily. But I'm just saying that's a concern that I have. Sure. I'm just asking questions as far as if there was something there, would they be required fence-wise, or would we both need to be required fence-wise to kind of make a change? There's nothing that would require them to have to do anything with the fence under the current conditions because they're doing a succession of things. That's correct. Okay. Good enough. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. My name is Stephen Stewart, and uh, I grew up on that property that says 340 North adjacent to this property. My father installed a great big commercial window to have the most beautiful view of that chicken coop, which we've had for the last 50 years. And we've been, it's part of the family. But my concern is this. Once you've turned that into a two-unit dwelling, and by the way, we've known the occupants of that property for 50 years. And we have, we're not aware that have, it had been sold, and the occupants are no longer living there. Previous. But my concern is you turn a unit into a two dwelling home, and they sell it, who polices it to make sure that if the, the, who owns it wants to turn it into two apartments, and if not, who evicts the people in the, in the basement? Who's going to overlook in the future that when this is sold, the stipulations that the owners live upstairs, it's a stipulation. Have to, the owners have to buy that knowing they're going to have to live there, and they do not have a two-unit apartment. I'd like to know who polices that. I think the neighbors do more, more policing than anybody else. And, um, if something's reported in the city, we'll have to follow up on that if it's not in compliance. Okay. All right. Well, we'll keep our eye open. <laughs> Is that right or wrong? That's right. Okay. All right. Wrong. Because so we got to keep our eyes open on that one. So who? And they, and they can live either upstairs or downstairs. There's no, no limitation as to where the owner yeah. occupants has yeah. to live. So I understand that. But I wasn't aware it had changed hands, and I know the owner doesn't live there anymore. So who is currently owning that place? Can you tell me who the owner is? The applicant's Terry Oiler. That's who's applied, I assume. That. Is his father the oiler that's on the city, and the city, so hard high, high by the city? Um, Terry Oiler is Dave Oiler, the city manager. Okay, so it did change hands. Wow. Well, no. So you're, the, what you're suggesting is that it doesn't meet the criteria because the owner doesn't live there. Is that well? I wasn't aware that it changed hands. We none of us were. I, I don't know who lives there, but the city's determined that they currently no one lives there. Yeah, I, I don't know that anybody oh, lives there today. But they're selling the property. Yeah. And, oh, okay. And there's no people there. Yeah, 
that was my concern because I know the owner doesn't live there. So if the new owner lives there and you have a renter, does that yeah. resolve your concern? Or? Well, yeah, I just don't want to see a two apartment dwelling. Nobody lives there and I don't want to see that in the future and I wasn't aware how that would be tracked and apparently it would be beyond, be beyond your scope to do so. so. It's up to us to make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Are there any other comments? Um, Dave, when you, earlier you mentioned that previously this had been being used as an accessory apartment downstairs where two different families. Is, is that right or wrong? I know that people out here would know. Has that ever been an accessory apartment downstairs? Yes. Where, where, so, so, so it already has been utilized in that way. And what the city is trying to do is make it so if they're going to do that, that it's legal. And they're not doing it under the table. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Where it was used as, as, a, as an accessory as an apartment, accessory apartment before. And they stopped using it for some period of time that was more than a year. And they lost their legal right. So, so they did have a legal right apartment. to it previously. I thought maybe it was just done on the slide or something. No, so there was a continued conditional use permit in essence in place. Yeah. Um, Would there be a just, record of that? Sorry. The structure was built back well before anything that we'd have a record of a building permit for. My understanding of when the apartment was used in the basement would be in the same way. Our records go back to maybe the early 70s. We're talking about some period of time that predates that. Now, if the apartment had been in use since the end of the day, we would not be having this discussion. They have the legal right to continue to use it as it was used. That's the so we mentioned grandfathered earlier. That's what it would be. But because they stopped using the apartment, in order to start using it again legally, you as the Planning Commission would have to approve a conditional use, which is why we're here tonight. So the, did the banks ever have anybody else living in there besides their family? So they were also using it as an accessory apartment. And so that's been recent, is what you're saying. So it has been used as an accessory apartment recently, which was not within the last years that we understand. So that's oh, why. So 1930s. Oh, no, I'm yes. talking about Roger. Okay. Yes. It, that family. Okay, so it hasn't been recently. There was some concern, I know with some of the neighbors, about this being a zone change to be able to accommodate maybe like a fourplex or a duplex or something like that. And and the and the zoning on it just to is that that can't happen, nor could it happen if they even got the property, nothing like that could ever happen because that's how it's zoned and that is just not even within that zone. And I know uh, the other neighbor, I thought they were going to be here this evening, but they're not able to make it. Had a concern about that, that if they allow yeah. them to do that, then there possibly could be a zone change with that much property. There might be a push to do something like that. So just like building on the back of the flag lot is what you're Yeah, doing. yeah. And so just just as record or to, to make clarity of that, so that I don't know if she's watching this or whatever else, that couldn't possibly happen, and no construction could take place unless there was a zone change, and that it just wouldn't happen. So I, I think there's kind of two things that I see there, and, and staff help me out here. Uh, right now, flag lots are not an allowed thing here in the city. For so big, for a yeah, separate, big. so a separate piece of property, they couldn't take this property, split it into two, and create a flag lot for it to be built on. Now, in terms of zoning, I'll turn to you, Dave. In terms of what what is allowed within an R16 with regards to 
multifamily kind of dwellings. Um, today, we only allow single family dwellings in the R160, which frankly is kind of new. Um, up until seven or eight years ago, you could have done duplexes, threeplexes, and fourplexes, which is why when you drive through this older part of town, you see those scattered throughout. Um, it's just a matter of having enough land to meet a certain requirement. You could have done multifamily structures, but uh, I think you might have been on, you were probably on the city council back and made that change. You might have been on the planning commission. So it would have just barely predated you when, um, in an effort to do some of the things that were mentioned tonight, um, we, uh, as a city, became concerned about the ratio of renter-occupied to owner-occupied structures in this part of the city. Um, understanding that a certain number of, of renters is fine and communities work well with that, but you want to keep a balance. In an effort to, to maintain a certain balance, the city council changed our ordinance so that in the R16 zone, all you can have is a single-family dwelling which frankly has caused quite a few people some real concern, people that have plans to take advantage of development opportunities and build duplexes and fourplexes and things like that. But um, again, for some of the reasons that have been mentioned tonight, the city made that change so today, you can just have a single family dwelling and if your property is big enough, you can have an accessory apartment. Within that single family dwelling. Exactly, yeah. While I'm here, I need to correct one thing. We do not allow tandem parking for purposes of meeting a parking requirement. Obviously, if somebody parks a car behind another one on their property, that's we're not going to worry about that. But uh, it was unsettled. I thought I was going to be wrong about that. I was. So. All right. Any other comments? I'll go ahead and then close the public hearing and ask uh, the commissioners if they have any questions. When you say there's, they don't allow tandem parking. <laughs> That's how the ordinance reads, and I kind of think we probably need to be that. It, it, we, how would that fit this project, and how many cars legally could they put on this project if it went to an accessory apartment and be legal? You you could does park, anybody know? You can park way more than four cars on this property without having to tan it. Okay. Yeah. But, but you have to have at least space for four cars, right? Yeah, you do. That's you do. correct. And, and two of them have to be. And they can't be tan, so you can move any of them to the street without yeah. having to move none. Really. Exactly. That's the. Uh, that's that's the yeah. I have a question about um, the ownership of the property, because now that seems to be very confusing to me. So the rule is that to have an accessory apartment, the owner has to live in the home. But Part it, it seems like we're confused on who even owns the home. Is the applicant the owner of the home, and do they live there? Because the if that's not happening, either, then why would we be doing this? Yeah, the applicant has either recently purchased the home, or I know that they have the property under contract to purchase it, one of the two. Okay. And with that, they're, they're aware of that condition that they would have to reside if they use the property for the accessory apartment. Mm -hmm. And just relative to, to our procedure, it's not uncommon for us to consider different zone change requests and things like that when an applicant hasn't necessarily closed on the property, but just has plans to do that with the consent of the current owner. Um, for most of the proposals that you see, in fact, that's the case because people don't want to buy something until they're sure that they can maybe develop a subdivision or build a shopping center or something like that. So. Um, that's typically kind of the timing of things. Any other, any other questions? I'll ask one more question. And I don't know that this can change. I mean, because obviously we can impose conditions. No. But because of the, it meets all the other requirements, we can't stop this from happening but we can apply, apply conditions. Correct. So what's was concerned was the historical preservation of the area. Um, and I think, you know, there's many people who care about the preservation of historical things. What is the city's position on, I mean, if I bought a piece of property and wanted to tear down the house, is there a law that stops someone from doing that if it's historical? Like where, I'm just trying to understand. Um, relative to the city's position, that's, uh, I don't want to be the spokesperson for 
let's just say the city council on that, so they probably have different opinions. Um, but I can tell you what regulations we have and what we don't have. And in short, we don't have regulations that would prevent somebody from tearing down or substantially modifying any building in the city if the property owner chose to do that. Um, and it's my understanding that that, um, that lack of regulation that we have, it really is directly tied to um, officials' beliefs that people should have the opportunity and right to be able to do what they want with their property. Um, but that said, we've talked uh, several times, just the time I've worked for the city, about different things that could happen maybe to create for example, an historic district that wouldn't necessarily um, put any limitations in place um, or prevent somebody from tearing down a building um, or modifying it to the point that you wouldn't recognize it doing any of those types of things, but might simply just give somebody an, an incentive to preserve the historic character of a building. Um, so there's some things like that that we could do as a city um, without really spending a lot of time and money. Um, but in the end, they wouldn't necessarily be a real strong safeguard against having you know, maybe a home like this, which um, it'd be great to pull up the street view of this if you could. I mean, this is a great historic character. It's a beautiful home. Um, the type of thing I think you'd absolutely want to preserve and promote somebody to, to reinvest in and, and uh, keep up and maintain. Um, one way to uh, to make it very difficult for somebody to alter a structure or remove it is to have a structure placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's that, that's that's a, a more stringent, difficult process to go through. Um, but short of having that designation, I I'm not sure that there's a lot that you know at a local level a city can do to. Um, I think there's a state designation as well. But, uh, that, that, I'm thinking the district maybe fits more into that category. Uh, uh, I mean, as a state, you can, uh, structure, structure can we designate how to do that. Like, so. But I mean, beautiful, right? I mean, this is the type of thing that you don't want to see messed up. I mean, any, any, in my opinion, modification of the exterior of that building, you're going to mess it up. Um, it's not to say, in this case, the applicants could propose to do that in some point in the future if they'd like. They haven't done that. Uh, but like I said, the proposal is to keep the exterior of the structure completely intact, as you see there. And uh, I'll keep my personal feelings to myself, I guess, on it. But I'm is glad this, this is that the that. entrance to the, to the unit? That's my understanding, yeah. That's so the I mean, basement entrance. Yeah. Basement entrance. So that means and they, and they would still need to have, would you, are you required to have a separate entrance? We don't necessarily require that. Right. Typically, you have it. We don't necessarily require that. Any other questions? Or so we can talk more about that, by the way, about <laughs> creating a district. Well, I think that was a really good point. I think that. We have talked about it before, and honestly, the idea has not gained any traction. My sense is, first of all, I think we need to be clear that, that this isn't changing the zoning at all on it, but that the current zoning allows this to happen. Um, and so, as a, as a planning commission, we can't say no. Uh, so that's the plain and simple of it for us. But what we can do is look at is, you know, what, what is the impact of this proposed development, and are there any conditions that we need to place upon it to, to limit that impact beyond what's already in code. And again, correct me if I'm mis misstating anything. Um, I agree with the staff that the character of the building is, is wonderful. As an architect, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I don't believe that this will change the character of that uh, in terms of the structure itself. Uh, it sounds to me like the only concerns or comments comes down to the number of people and or number of vehicles. Uh, that's the sense that I get is that do you guys agree with that? And also, how it would be policed to make sure it was compliant always. Right. right. Can I make a comment on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, not that it's my job, to, so. but you know, I think the most important thing in our community is to help 
makes Spanish Fork the great community that it is, is that we reach out and get to know our neighbors. You all look like people who do that. So get to know the owner, know who they are, build that relationship, and a lot of your worries are going to be taken care of. Sounds like the sale is pending this uh, approval. I just saw some of the issues that uh, I've lived in as well. That we've made the difference. The neighbors made all the difference. What kind of limitation can you put on who lives there? Legally, I mean, really, what could we say? You have to be a family to live in an accessory apartment. You can't be students to live in an accessory apartment. I, I don't know what you can say and what you can't do. It, it seems like legally, in the past, we've said something like two adults and two adults and one child, or something like that. Isn't that how we've done it in the past? Yeah, we've only we've only waded into that discussion one time that I'm aware of, and uh, it. it can become pretty problematic. I, I, I'd recommend that you consider a number and nothing more than that. And I don't think, unfortunately, oh, we want to yeah. try to define family. Yes, right. that's big. And, and some cities, incidentally, when it comes to situations like this, they have adopted regulations that say, um, uh, maybe two adults and one child. And uh, you hear of stories that have been pulling at people's heartstrings and making the cities look really bad when you know, that first child gets joined by a baby brother or baby sister, and all of a sudden you've got you know, a, a compliance issue. And we don't know um, what I mean. Is this a one bedroom unit downstairs? Two I bedrooms? I think it's two bedrooms down. And two one, bedrooms. Yeah, two bedrooms. It's two bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. And one upstairs. It used to be two up, and then there's, there's just one now. That one now. Just yeah, so there's, yeah, so there's only three bedrooms in the whole house, right? There's two downstairs and one up. One, up, sir. one thing they do have is they have two exits in case of fire. Mm -hmm. They got one in the middle and one in the other end. To so the basement? Not just a one in the Oh, yeah. yeah. They've yeah. got two. So I, I, mean, I guess I would feel comfortable saying two adults. So that gives two students that could live there. But again, you're still limiting it to two vehicles, uh, potentially. You know, if you say, Two or four. If you say four adults, then all of a sudden you've got four cars there. So I think if you say two adults, that could be yeah, the that flexibility. And no, no, no uh, limit on juveniles. Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't know. I mean, to me, if it, I mean, if it's me, I'm in a two-bedroom apartment and I have two kids. I'm okay with that. As soon as I get to three, then you're you're going you're gonna to want to move anyway. And that's how I look at it. I think that becomes self-regulating. <laughs> I don't want to be. Calling Jason to say he's going to prosecute somebody because they got a baby, right? I mean, that's, that'd be my. It just looks awful to try to do it that way. Yeah. It's adult, it doesn't sound too bad. Of course, you may have to find an adult. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, people still call me juvenile all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what a judge would say, though, Jess. That's right. right. We're covered that way. <laughs> comments or questions? Oh, I'll just comment. I, I mean, the, the feedback is really good and really helpful. It's pretty clear that you, you know, really love your neighborhood and you want to see it stay the way it is. And as I look at this proposal and, and many others that we see, a lot of times I think to myself, well, if we didn't make any change, if this proposal was not even before us, in reality, some of the same concerns you have could, could be a concern if with just one new move in, one, one change in ownership, or, um, you know, two teenagers becoming driver age, you know, and then all of a sudden you have these same issues, and, and you know, the preservation is a really good idea, there's these, you know, some of these unique properties around town, and I don't know that this will affect that, but it just seems to me that when, when, we, when we evaluate these types of things, at least for me, I try to look at things like safety, you know, what what safety concerns would there be for the people in the in the unit, but also the neighborhood? You know, that would be important to consider. And I almost feel like the number of vehicles is more important if we're putting in limitations than the number of people because it's the coming and going of vehicles that cause a lot of impact. And I mean, I, I don't really see a reason that's rooted in safety or big impact on the on the neighborhood to say, you know, we shouldn't do this, but it seems reasonable to, to try to limit the 
the volume of people that will be there if you can, and you know, like you could say two vehicles and however number of people. If it, I, I think you just stick to the number of people versus adult, child, juvenile, um, and then you know that's a recommendation the city council can consider. And we're, 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 we're approving this. Oh, we get to approve this award. Oh, I didn't realize we even. Yeah, this is one of the this wow. is it. This is the real power, the moment of power. Huh? Um, okay. So anyway, I that's just my feeling, and, and uh, I think in reality, the policing of it, it will be no different than any other of the areas in town. Uh, you know, the city is pretty good to follow up on things that it knows about. And I know that the gentleman that was here had a real concern about a situation in another part of the city. You know, I don't know anything about that, my, but my experience with the city is that, you know, if there is a violation and it's reported that they will follow up on it. And I have all the confidence that they'll do that here. So, um, anyway, those are just, those are my comments. I, I think we, we, you know, we don't really have much choice. We should approve it. And, and uh, I would support like four individuals living there two and in two each, vehicles. Two in each unit. I mean, there's two units. Oh, so. two units down. You mean downstairs and upstairs? Right. right. I think we're I talking was about just the accessory apartment that we're, yeah. you know, sometimes I wonder whether that's the upstairs or downstairs based on what they're saying. So yeah, in the accessory, whichever that turns out to be. That's what yeah, I was okay. thinking. And then two vehicles. Of course, that doesn't mean that on a weekend, if, you know, if it's a, a person that has some children or some friends sleeping over and it has, you know, for 24, 48 hours. It's we would take that probably to mean that are registered uh, people that reside there. Yeah. Okay. That type of thing. Okay. So are we saying four people or two? Okay. Uh, I don't like the idea of trying to put a number on the, on the children necessarily if there's a family there and like you say, you got two kids and you have a baby. Well, you're out tomorrow or whatever. I like the idea of indicating how many adults uh, we limit that to, which would indicate how many cars, first of all, that you're meeting with. Exactly. And, you can always have a teenager. And I would feel bad if there were five kids living there, obviously. You know what, a small one. Yeah, and that, you know. Well, we've got there's three conditions that the the uh, that the development committee has already. Committee. Do you want that, Jason? Oops. It's there on the right hand column. There's three items there. And they were adding. And they were adding the condition of limiting two adults in the accessory apartment. Have to meet the conditions of the de development committee plus. There you go. Is it, is it two adults, but there could be children then too? Do we specify children in that? I just think we did just two adults. Okay. With the understanding that they could, could have children. Yeah. Okay. So. Do we say that? It'd <laughs> be helpful somehow to make sure we get that. Do I mean to make the motion? That's what it's I saying. can make the Okay, so I'll make the motion that we approve the conditional use of the property on 260 West 300 North as an access to have an accessory apartment with the conditions outlined in the development review committee with the additional condition that the accessory apartment can have only two adults living there as well as any children. And no more than two vehicles. But that's already part of the title 13. Not necessarily, no. Two vehicles oh. are the minimum required. Okay. Parking for two. Is Parking, Parking for two. two. Okay. They could have with one no, with an additional condition that they only be able to have two vehicles tied with accessory. Good. <laughs> That's what I have a motion by Commissioner Tag. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Second by Commissioner Nielsen. We'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Starting with Aye. 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 Thank you so much for your time. It's very much appreciated. And, uh
we wish that more people would come out to these meetings.